he was Spartacus' closest brother in arms, without equal, when Spartacus was nothing, ostracized by all. Only he offered unconditional help with everything he had. Yet today, Spartacus was forced to kill him with his own hands. As Vero lay dying on the ground, the satisfied nobles below clapped their hands in contentment. No one cared about Spartacus' despair at that moment. Watching Spartacus in agony and confusion, Ilithia revealed a triumphant, sinister smile. Because this bloodbath of fratricide was exactly what Ilithia had arranged in revenge against Spartacus. Using her own body as a bargaining chip. Just days before, Spartacus and Vero had been sent to the arena to fight against a dozen gladiators. Thanks to their flawless coordination, they managed to kill all the gladiators and survive. New Marius, the son of Calavius, was deeply impressed by Spartacus' fighting prowess. A few days later it was New Marius' bar mitzvah, and Batiatus immediately proposed a birthday feast for New Marius at his house. New Marius was thrilled, as it meant he could witness Spartacus' valor up close. After returning, Batiatus quickly approached Spartacus and Crixus. To win New Marius' favor, Batiatus planned to have Spartacus and Crixus face off at the birthday feast. The clash between the current and former champions of Capua was sure to be exciting and full of spectacle. Of course, it was just a show match. Batiatus repeatedly reminded them to hold back, allowing some blood but strictly no killing. After all, both were his costly investments, and Batiatus couldn't afford any mishaps. Batiatus had his own motives for going to such lengths to organize this birthday feast. He aimed to use the event to strengthen his relationship with Calavius and pave his way in politics. If he succeeded, all the expenses would be worth it. Batiatus planned to make his request to Calavius after the dinner. However, things did not go as he had anticipated. The seemingly calm arena was rife with underlying dangers. Ilithia, having emerged from the shadows of the masked Carnivali, directed all her hatred towards Spartacus. Seeing the deep brotherly bond between Spartacus and Vero, Ilithia conceived a vicious plan for revenge. It is blood and flesh, granting life to the world. Meanwhile, Crixus trained harder than usual, seizing this birthday feast as an opportunity to regain his past glory. Deep down, Crixus always felt that the honors now bestowed upon Spartacus were stolen from him. Spartacus' arrogance only fueled Crixus' determination to reclaim his champion title. During a secret rendezvous with Naidia that night, Crixus confessed his true feelings to his beloved. You will feel the hands of a champion once again upon you. The match with Spartacus is but exhibition. I know the crowd is my heart. Dominus forbids injury. To make attempt on Spartacus's life is to... is to risk your own. This is my life. Then I must be without my mind. To love only the man. However, they were unaware that this intimate moment was witnessed by Ashur, and this night of passion would turn out to be their last joyous moment. Soon, the day of the birthday feast arrived and numerous officials and nobles gathered at Batiatus' mansion. Of course, this included the scheming Ilithia. Under Batiatus' arrangement, Spartacus took Numerius on a tour of the training ground. Numerius couldn't contain his joy, but he showed Spartacus a few moves, and Numerius accidentally soiled his clothes. To avoid spoiling the evening's banquet, Lucretia suggested Numerius take a bath. Seeing the naive young man, Ilithia found the perfect target for her revenge plan. While Numerius was bathing, Ilithia sneaked in. In order to complete her revenge on Spartacus, she reached out to Numerius. For the next half hour, what transpired inside remained unknown to all. The time for the duel performance soon arrived. Batiatus had set up a makeshift arena in the hall, and Spartacus and Crixus were eager to begin. To please Calavius, Batiatus gave Numerius the authority to oversee the exhibition match. Champion of Capua. Step forward. Crixus, former champion, step... Wait. I fear Crixus has seen his best day past. I would have Varro fight in his place. At this moment, Crixus wanted to kill someone, but he was just a small slave, so he could only swallow his anger and gnash his teeth. It was a great honor for them to be able to perform in front of the nobles and officials, in order to achieve the effect of the performance. Although there was bloodshed, they also enjoyed it.
A spectacular performance should have ended with applause and cheers. But then Numerius made a downward gesture. The crowd was stunned. This gesture signified a death sentence for the loser. Batiatus hurriedly explained to Calavius that it was just a show match, not meant to be fatal. It must be blood. Father, we'll reimburse you the cost of the man. To the nobility, a slave's life was like livestock, valued in money, but to Spartacus, Vera was a brother with whom he had shared life and death. How could he bear to strike? Seeing Spartacus hesitate, and under Calavius' urging, Batiatus reluctantly ordered the guards to force Spartacus to act. They will kill us both. There is no choice. Not this time. Spartacus. In the end, Spartacus tearfully plunged his sword into Vero's body. As Vero fell, thunderous applause filled the room. Ilithia's first phase of revenge was a success. A gladiator's death was a loss, but it was worth it for Calavius' favor. Seizing the moment, Batiatus expressed his political ambitions to Calavius, indicating his willingness to start from a low-level position. However, Calavius' response crushed Batiatus' hopes. He stated that politics required noble status or significant social standing. Batiatus, at best, was a skilled gladiator trainer, far from qualified for politics. Conversely, Batiatus' rival, Salonius, while not great with gladiators, had a substantial background. Caladius decided to recommend Salonius for the Senate. Furious, Batiatus realized his efforts had inadvertently benefited his enemy. Feeling deeply humiliated, Batiatus vowed revenge, determined to make them pay in blood. On the other hand, Varro's death plunged Spartacus into endless agony. No longer the invincible champion of the arena, he seemed like a fragile, isolated child. In his moment of immense pain, Mira, the woman he once rejected, embraces Spartacus and gives him a glimpse of warmth in this dark society. Varro's death plunged Spartacus into endless guilt and torment. During the funeral, Enomaus consoled Spartacus, saying that a gladiator dying in the arena was the highest honor and that Spartacus should recover from his grief soon. Spartacus couldn't understand what honor meant for a gladiator. Varro's death was merely a pastime for the noble children. After their laughter, who would care about Varro's life or death? Who would worry about the widow and orphan he left behind? To honor his brother, Spartacus neglected to treat the wounds he had sustained in the exhibition match. This neglect almost cost him his life. After dealing with the body, Vero's wife accused Spartacus of killing her husband, lamenting that Vero had treated him like a true brother. Speechless, Spartacus was further drowned in guilt by Vero's wife's accusations. Meanwhile, Batiatus' hatred for Calavius peaked. He had gone to great lengths to organize the birthday feast, yet gained nothing and lost a gladiator. More infuriating was Calavius mocking his family and background. Unable to swallow this insult, Batiatus, known for his vengeful nature, devised a revenge plan to make the old man pay dearly. Batiatus called Spartacus to comfort him and said that he would deal with Calavius by all means. Moved, Spartacus promised to follow his master's orders unconditionally. Seeing his regained influence, Batiatus changed the topic. In a few days, a grand duel was scheduled between the champions of Pompeii and Capua. Usually, Batiatus' rival Salonius represented Capua, but this year it was finally his turn. To restore the Batiatus family's glory, he decided to send Spartacus against the champion of Pompeii. No longer believing in gladiator honor, Spartacus only trusted the prize money in his hands. To honor Varro's last wish and his compensation, Spartacus decided to give all his future winnings to Varro's widow. Despite this, Spartacus hadn't recovered from the loss of his brother. He was consumed by sorrow and guilt. Disinterested even in routine training, his prolonged grief led to an infected wound, resulting in a high fever that caused him to collapse on the training ground. Seeing Spartacus still unconscious, Batiatus was extremely anxious. He ordered the physician to do everything to treat Spartacus and arranged for Mira to take care of him. But with the big fight tomorrow, it seemed impossible for Spartacus to participate. In this desperate situation, Enomaus suggested Crixus to Batiatus. With no other choice, Batiatus agreed. Upon hearing the news, Crixus was overjoyed. After being suppressed for half a year, he finally had the opportunity to showcase his talent and reclaim his former glory. The day of the match finally arrived. But the strange thing was that Calavius, who was supposed to preside over the tournament, was late in arriving. As the audience grew impatient, 
Domitia requested Batiatus to replace Calavius in giving the opening speech. Crixus! Mamilo! When the crowd learned that Crixus was replacing Spartacus, cheers filled the stands. They have forgotten the honor that I bought them. Then it is time you reminded them who their true champion is. Encouraged by Enamos, Crixus finally mustered the courage to enter the arena, facing the champion of Pompeii, Pericles. Pericles was a formidable opponent, never defeated by any Capuan in past contests. If Crixus won, it would be a new record for Capua. At Batiatus signal, the duel began. <laughs> Amidst the jeers, Crixus struggled and kept losing ground. Okay. Lucretia on the stage was so worried about Crixus that she almost fainted, and Batiatus ordered Naivia to take her down to rest. Fortunately, Crixus eventually stood up. Nothing fuels a fighter in the arena like a fierce desire to win. Despite being the underdog, Crixus unleashed his pent-up fury and resilience. With a swift turn, he sliced open Pericles' belly. Amidst the cheers of 10,000, Crixus finally killed Pericles and vindicated himself. But looking towards the stands, Crixus couldn't find Naidia, even with the world's cheers and applause. Victory felt meaningless without sharing it with his beloved. In stark contrast, Batiatus was elated on the stands, losing himself in the joy of the moment. Yet, the real drama was just beginning. The victory was merely the appetizer of this bloody feast. Remember Calavius, who was conspicuously absent. At that moment, one of Batiatus' men brought him a letter. It stated that Calavius' carriage and attendants' bodies were found outside the city. But Calladius himself was missing. As Domitia and Numerius were bewildered, Batiatus proposed to take Numerius on a search. His real intention was to lure them into the trap he had set. Unbeknownst to them, Batiatus had arranged for Calladius' kidnapping right after Numerius' coming of age celebration. As a slave was cleaning Spartacus' body with a metal tool, he accidentally touched a wound. Spartacus checked and was shocked to find golden objects inside. Before he could understand, a flood of gold coins poured out from his wound. In his astonishment, Vero told him this was how his master saw him, a body to be drained dry for his wealth. Spartacus awoke from his dream, realizing he couldn't just be a slave, a tool for his master's gain. Fearing Spartacus' delirium might worsen his wounds, the physician ordered Mira to tie Spartacus firmly to the bed with a belt. This dream woke him up. But what happened next would become the direct spark for Spartacus' slave uprising. Days earlier, Batiatus had approached Calladius, seeking a recommendation for a political career. However, Calladius refused him due to his lowly family background. Worse, Calladius recommended Batiatus' rival, Salonius, to the Senate right in front of him, feeling deeply insulted. Batiatus immediately arranged for the assassin Aulus to kidnap Calavius. Aulus was the coachman who killed Spartacus' wife. Batiatus had Calavius taken to a sewer near the city. Guarded by Ashur and Aulus, Batiatus humiliated and berated Calavius, even physically assaulting him in his rage. Ashur was worried. After all, Calavius was a high-ranking official. Discovery would mean death for all three. Batiatus was infuriated. He had his own plans for what he wanted to do, and it wasn't up to him, a small slave, to say anything. After giving the orders to continue the watch, Batiatus left. Soon after he left, they found Calavius sitting stiffly, motionless. Aulus checked on him, but Calavius suddenly bit Aulus' neck. In rage, Aulus punched Calavius hard in the face. Ah sure, sensing trouble, quickly pulled Aulus away urging him to hurry back to the training ground to seek medical treatment. What Aulus didn't realize was that the man living next door to him was Spartacus, who was in a coma. The physician gave Aulus a sleeping potion for rest, promising improvement upon waking, and left Mira in charge of Spartacus while he went to eat. Meanwhile, Asher had his own plans. He found Batiatus' rival Salonius and informed him of Calavius' kidnapping. Asher was anxious to disassociate himself from Batiatus because he didn't want to be implicated in Batiatus' madness. In ancient Rome, 
Kidnapping a high official could lead to severe repercussions, Salonius was initially skeptical until Asher showed him Calavius' ring, desperate to impress Calavius. Salonius followed Asher to the abduction site with a pocket knife. Upon reaching the sewer, they heard footsteps above. Asher, scared, ran off despite Salonius' objections. Salonius, of course, would not give up this once-in-a-lifetime chance to make a difference, so he took out his knife and freed Calavius alone. However, the moment he removes the hood, Salonius is dumbfounded, because Caladius has already been killed by someone who cut his neck. Meanwhile, after the duel, Batiatus arrived with Numerius. Numerius witnessed everything. No! No! Salonius was speechless, framed for a crime he didn't commit. Batiatus immediately ordered Salonius arrest. Ah sure, smugly appearing behind Batiatus, revealed the entire plot was a setup. Batiatus aimed to eliminate both Caladius and Salonius. Now, with the evidence against him, Salonius had no chance to defend himself. On the other hand, Spartacus had woken up from his coma and was shocked to see Aulus in the next bed. Aulus died on the day his wife died. How come he's still alive? Spartacus asked Mira to untie him to check Aulus' wound. Release the straps. I would speak to this man alone. Towards what purpose? Wait in the corridor. A sound warning if anyone approaches. Over time, Mira had fallen deeply in love with Spartacus. After some thought, she untied him. Spartacus, finding no wound on Aulus' stomach, realized his wife's death might have been a complete conspiracy. Spartacus grabbed Aulus by the neck and asked Aulus who ordered him to kill his wife. I am a dead. I come Who spoke the words? In his grief, Spartacus strangled Aulus to death. At that moment, a plan for revenge began to form in Spartacus' mind. Mira, instead of panicking, helped clean up the scene. Batiatus, unaware of the crisis, believed Aulus died from his injuries. Batiatus is happy because now there is one less person who knows his secret. As a reward for Usher's loyalty and resourcefulness, Batiatus exempted him from slavery and allowed him to come and go as he pleased. Meanwhile, Spartacus fully recovered and returned to the training ground. Spartacus! You are well? Yes, Dominus. I am myself again. Soon after, amidst the scorn of thousands, Salonius was brought to the arena for a public trial. Facing Spartacus, fighting an elderly man like Salonius was like using a butcher's knife to slaughter a chicken for Spartacus. After a few rounds, the powerless Salonius was brought to his knees. You take the wrong life. You must about Yatus. Here's the felon. And she'll join you presently. Hearing Spartacus' words, a furious Salonius finally burst into laughter, embracing his death. 